It looks like uh, it's going to be one of these days today where nothing works for me, but uh, no, that's not working anymore. Maybe as it heats up. Anyway, welcome. Luckily, it's the last lecture of the uh, term. Um, so we've we turned this, yeah, it's technically the I saw a few of you uh, frowning at that point. Technically, this is the last lecture um, because next week we have the, the kind of final rehearsal presentations. Um, and that'll be next Wednesday. So next Tuesday, is it next Tuesday? Next week could be two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, next week's a break, is it? Yeah, that's a holiday on Tuesday and a holiday on Friday. Okay, apologies. Next time we meet then, um, our lecture is on the Wednesday instead and it's in the form of the rehearsal presentations. Uh, don't take what comes out of my mouth as fact, just look on the website. Um, so this lecture is going to be about protivation, and it's about uh, this term wasn't coined by me, but uh, I quite like it. It's quite nice and gimmicky. Um, it's about prototyping both the market and the technology. So a few of you are actually probably past this point already. A few of you it's probably coming at the right time for. So basically we'll have an introduction to prototyping. We'll take a break. We'll do some market testing or think of ways we can test our markets. Then we'll move on to uh, technical feasibility and then at the end we'll do a quick course roundup because it'll be the last time we'll be all sat together. So does anybody remember this diagram? Anyone tell me what it is? <laughs> this is about 13 weeks ago. So this was uh, introduced to you right at the beginning of the course. It was the integrated product development model. So it's basically saying that the business composes of three essential elements, an established market, established and well-designed product, and a production system. And the need for the business can come from any one of these three. So it can come from a, a new market op, um, idea, a new idea for a new product or some new production capabilities. Now, for you, when you're prototyping, you'll, you should have established all three of these disciplines of the integrated product development process, but some of them will be a little bit less established than others. So for you now, it's about asking questions as to which one of these are you lagging behind on? Which one should you be doing more proof on? So if you take your own product, your own project, what questions might we ask of your market feasibility? Well, let's do it in general. What questions may we ask of a project's market feasibility? Does anyone want to offer one? So if you're stood in front of an investor pitching a business idea, what might be the first question the investor asks with respect to the market? Size of the market, yep. So how many potential customers are in that market? What else? How do you get to the market? Okay, access to market or route to market? Risk. Risk, okay. Segments of users. Sorry? Segments of users. User segmentation, very good. Okay, so nice bit of a recap on the course. I just put down a couple here. You might be asking right now about your own projects. Uh, do users really want my design, for example? And these might be the things you need to test. The uh, examiner may say to you, well, you've shown me this neat product, but how do I know users actually want it? And furthermore, how do I know how much they're willing to pay for it? And is the market really that big? I suggested a moment ago. So in terms of the product, I mean, if these are questions related to the feasibility of the market, what might be some questions related to the feasibility of the product? Or how, how good a quality the product is? Does it work? Does it work? That is the main question. Any others? Does it work as desired? Okay. Yeah. Do you, have, do you have a suggestion? Price of the product. 
price of the product. I think that relates more to the, the market and the production rather than the, uh, the product. But fundamentally, does it work? So a lot of you will have your products, you've designed them. Um, I think the examiner will be asking the question, does it work? And quite a few of your groups don't really have proof as yet whether it does. Um. <laughs> uh, also, does it look good? So there's aesthetics about it. Is it appealing to the market? And how about on the production side? What questions might we ask? Or might the examiner ask? Can it be produced? <laughs> can it be produced? Yeah. So can you manufacture or, or buy in the individual parts? Any other suggestions? What does it cost? What does it cost to produce? Yep. Okay. So what about, does the product have the desired properties off the production line? Is it to the right quality, the right stiffness, the right weight. And also, can we produce it to the required cost volume ratio? So perhaps we want to uh, produce this at varying uh, batch sizes and we want varying cost um, prices of the product. And also the things such as assembly. Can the product be assembled, transported, packed and so on? So there's many questions we can ask about our projects and products related to this integrated product development model. Now, one of your tasks at the moment is you've obviously got limited time left, and I think with all startups, you've got limited time left. But you may have a series of questions, and all of these may only be partially uh, resolved, and some of them may have little question marks over. But one of your first tasks at the moment is to say, which is the biggest question mark? Of which of these questions does the biggest question mark reside? So not all projects are that easy to do this. So if we think of better place, where would we say the burning questions or the biggest questions are with the better place model? Do you think it's that simple to identify? Did anyone tell me what specific thing what specific question better place need to deal with? Um, does it work? Does it work? Okay. But does what work? The system, like with the, the different uh, stations where you can load with ah. batteries and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Does the users uh, want the product? Do the users want the product? Yeah. But I, I think they're completely valid questions, but. The thing with a better place is it's such a, a large, complex system. You can't really ask those questions. It's not so productive to ask those questions of the whole system. And if you ask it of the individual components of the system, it depends on the results of the other individual components of the system. Um, so it's a really difficult uh, one to pin down. And I think if you land in a situation where you're designing a product where you can't really identify which components of the product really need testing to bring it to market, then you might be in a bit of a difficult situation just as better place up. Now there are simpler products like AuroClean. Now hopefully you should be able to see already that it's quite a lot easier with a product like AuroClean to identify where the burning or big questions are. So AuroClean, just in case you don't remember, were, was Jana and Lurker's uh, project which they won the Venture Cup with. And this was about um, a centrifuge which could clean the mercury from gold, but a very low cost one. So I think it was uh, miners in Colombia or gold foragers in Colombia to take it with them, put the compounds in or the, the ore in, turn the centrifuge and uh, separate out the mercury. So can anyone offer me what they think was the burning questions with, uh, with AuroClean? If you were the investors with a, a wad of money, what would you want to know from them? What were you less convinced of? Can you make the users use it? Can you make the users use it? That's right. So it was, dem it was having to demonstrate the value proposition to the users. Um, I think that's what I'd go for as well. Were there any other suggestions on what you were less convinced about with AuroClean? Uh, 
take it to different countries and are they really interested in making the poor people richer? Okay, that's very deep. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think you're right there. But I, I didn't actually think about that one, but uh, yeah, good point. Any others? Go ahead. A working prototype. And I, I think when it uh, came to their project, looking over their presentation, that was what they were really concerned of, and that's what they thought was going to be their downfall. So what did they do? They went to an expert, they produced a, a concept or a scheme of how they believed their centrifuge would work, scaling it down uh, from a, a different centrifuge model, and then getting an expert to evaluate this and saying, uh, uh, what, does they, what do they say? Um, the centrifuge is a well-known proven technology to separate two materials or different uh, densities. Uh, through calculations on a centrifuge, it can be uh, concluded that the centrifuge can be scaled down to the benefit without any change in relative centrifugal force. I therefore acknowledge that the technical aspects of Oroclean concept are fully feasible. Now, as an investor, this may not quite be enough, but it's certainly probably enough to want to see it through to the next round or be interested to take it further. So they identified, I think, that this was one of the big questions over their product, and therefore they went off to get some kind of proof in the form of a uh, written letter from an expert. Uh, Edgeflow. So apart from uh, Jakob, what are the main problems with Edgeflow? What are the burning questions there? It's a tiny market. Are you sure you want to be in the room for this? <laughs> okay, it's difficult to establish the size of the market. Um, Does it actually work as promised? Does it work as promised? Uh, and I think that's, in Jakob's mind and the technology developer's mind, that isn't an issue. But in the mind of the customers, uh, according to last week, it is a bit of an issue, that, as in they want proof, they want to be able to see it working. Go on. Fall down the roofs? Sorry? Uh, fall down the roofs? Ex <laughs> yeah, the safety elements. Yeah. Would you say that's a, a good representation, Jakob? <laughs> of, course, uh, of course, I wouldn't be spending my time on something I didn't uh, think had a market, though. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but aside from that, uh, indeed, yes, I think it's... Uh, I think it's very true. Um, the the problem I, I presented last week, I presented the, the catch twenty two of uh, of Edgeflow. Uh, essentially, the problem right now is that we have a prototype working. Uh, we know that it's efficient. Uh, we know that it's you know we know that this effect that drink that sort of that is sort of behind the whole idea of Edgeflow, the speed up effect as that occurs as the wind hits the building, is is actually there and that it's you know significant. The problem is just uh, going from having a prototype like this one and to having something that's, you know, ready to put up on a roof, something that we can actually, uh, you know, assure our customers that this is not going to fall off the roof or this, there's not going to, you know, you won't, be a see, you won't see a wing falling off anytime soon and things like that. Uh, and unfortunately, that costs a heck of a lot of money <laughs> to get to that point. So um, it's, uh, it's uh, actually a bit of a case of uh, technical development uh, needing to be done, uh, and that costs money. Okay, thanks very much. So I think um, we'll go through a kind of taxonomy of the different types of prototypes, but it's clear from Jakob's commentary what uh, Edgeflow really needs is a functioning prototype, one which is actually scaled to the correct scale and working as it should be. Maybe the production techniques can be slightly different, but people want to see it running and in operation. So we're gonna do a little group exercise. Uh, just quickly, where's group number uh, one? There's group one here. No, group two. So group two down the front, three. Okay, so we're gonna switch this round a bit. Take off group one, uh, group two goes with, oh, crikey, this is falling down already. Uh, group four, group five, 
group five aren't here. That doesn't work either, group six. Okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, I'll let your, yourselves self-organize a little bit here. But essentially what I want you to do is get your team to pair up with another team. Um, and one of your teams will be the A team and the other team will be the B team. And I want you to spend a while where the A teams uh, ask the B teams some questions about their project's feasibility. So essentially you're going to be the panel of judges or investors evaluating the other team's feasibility. And I want the other team to start producing a list of the burning questions that they're asking. Uh, so you'll have five minutes to do that. So if you can see a, a team adjacent to you, just go sit next to them, go uh, cosy up to them. Off you go. Oh, if, you, if you're not sure what you're doing, put your hand up if you have a question. Okay, I think we'll have to stop there. If you'd, uh, you're welcome to go back to your original tables if you like now. If you want a bit more space. Does anybody else want a couple more minutes? Any other teams? No? <laughs> okay, is it, can you come back to it in the break? Is that right? So did any teams, were any teams asked questions that they weren't really anticipating to be asked? Or did any questions come up that you, you really weren't focusing on as core to the rest of your project? Folks, do you want to uh, just call it a quit now? You can uh, come back to it in the break. So, and at the back, team at the back. Hello, whoa. <laughs> We're back in the plenum now, if that's all right. Um, I'm just, weren't, well, basically this is me asking, was that of any use? Did any questions come up that you weren't previously concentrating on? Has it helped you think about what you're going to do for the rest of uh, this project time now? Um, anyone like to uh, offer a commentary? Yeah, I think um, the outside opinion puts a bit more pressure on us yeah. and puts us out of that kind of naive feeling that everything's going to work out, you know? Okay. So it's good to have a, someone to try and make it a realistic idea. And do you, do you have a, a market question to focus on now? Yeah, will, will it work? And, um, will it work is a big question. And who are we going to supply it to? Okay. So, Maybe, uh, there's probably another couple of questions for that. so the point of the rest of this, this workshop and presentation session today is taking those, those market questions and later we'll be moving on to the technical feasibility questions and thinking how can we set up prototypes to test these, these major burning market questions. Would anyone else like to uh, uh, say something about their, uh, their quick group work session? Otherwise we'll move on. Okay. So as I say, once you've identified the major questions that need answering, what the investors will really want to know, then we've got to try and find prototypes in order to test them. So would anyone like to offer me a, a definition? What would you think a prototype is? Something showing functionality, okay. Any other offers? Showing whatever you wish to show, like display. Okay, showing something, whatever you wish to display about the project, I guess. And any advances on that? I guess there's a slight difference between just a mock up and the prototype, where the prototype is closer to the final product than, than the mock up. It just really shows the functionality of the product. That's a very good point. Um, there is a semantic difference between mock-up and prototype, uh, according to some authors, according to some disciplines. I think in architecture, in industrial design, the mock-up is early stages and the prototype is something later stages. For the purpose of today, um, I'm coming from the school, that prototype is basically any model that tests an aspect of a product's feasibility. So that ranges from the early stage mock-ups to the very late stage uh, prototypes. 
So the taxonomy of prototypes we're going to be working with today are five different prototypes. Firstly, a proof of principle, a form study prototype, user experience prototype, a visual prototype, and a functional prototype. Um, there may be others, perhaps you can comment on it afterwards once we've gone through the list. So a proof of principle prototype is in electronics, type of built on a breadboard device. Um, this is essentially, does the mechanism, underlying mechanism or working principle of the device work? So for the, the guys with the edema relieving foot pedal, it would be, does the mechanism in this foot pedal actually make the plate go up and down to the angles uh, desired and at the rate desired? Um, and an important aspect of this is it can be used to identify which of your designs or concepts are not suitable. So it's not just about finding the ones that are, it's predominantly about quickly <coughs> removing the ones that aren't suitable. And lots of uh, companies, engineering design companies, uh, famously done by Toyota, deploy this fail often and early uh, strategy, which is they do so many proof of principle functional prototypes very early on. They spend a little bit more money on it, but they learn extremely rapidly. And you identify things by doing these mock-ups and early designs that you wouldn't do based on paper. So Dyson, uh, he's kind of my hero of engineering design, uh, such a sexy product, the vacuum cleaner. Uh, he actually produced 5,127 prototypes before he produced his uh, bagless vacuum cleaner. Um, if you go to his uh, factory, which is just near Bath, uh, he makes a real exhibition of this. So you walk into the, the building and all the prototypes are laid out in sequence. He makes a, a real thing and he, he's actually started up a, or tried to start up an engineering design school in the UK, which is all based around kind of getting your hands dirty, early stage prototypes, <coughs> mocking up and so on. And here's a, a nice little quote um, from his website. He deploys a hammer test from the very early stages when he used to be an inventor, which was he either threw his prototypes down the stairs or smacked them with a hammer just to test whether these things are robust enough, whether things will fall off them and so on. And now it's a lot more rigorous, as it says here. Each prototype must endure 550 tests. So the point of the prototype isn't just to prototype something, it is to test. You do them because you know what question you want to answer. In Dyson's case, they're very rigorous with it. They'll produce prototypes and have a series of standardized tests that they'll go through. Then there is the form study prototype. So this is just to get rough uh, outline dimensions of the product. So it might be you're designing a um, a kiosk in a shopping centre and you want to know where the lines of vision are, uh, whether things are suitable, ergonomic, you can reach things, perhaps it's in workstation design, perhaps it's in handhold game controllers uh, so that you, you know it fits in the palm of your hand well and so on. Any, anyone else got examples of uh, form, form design prototypes? Anyone created one themselves? Nobody's created a form design Prototype. Okay, what what did you prototype? Yeah, we did, um, it was uh, to conceal a special um, issue, so we sort of made it, I think, half scale, okay. just to see the dimensions and the, yeah, where to fit everything. But it was a lot of contacts, and, and you had to be able to open it so you could serve. The machine size. Okay. Okay. So it was about the the space and the user interaction with it. Okay. I, I suspect most of you from the design and innovation program will have produced quite a few of these foam foam mockups. Here's I don't know if you've seen the Dyson hand dryer, but the the air blade. Um, here's a simple uh, mockup from foam, just showing how it would sit on the wall, what sort of size it would look, whether your hands can fit in, what sort of height it would have to be for it to be comfortable so you can actually use the design. Obviously nothing in this is working, 
but you can get a lot from this form prototype. Here's a couple of nice examples of uh, handhold cutting tools producing the form. They don't have to have a sharp blade on, it's just how do, how do they fit in the hand, how would you use them? Then we have experience prototypes. So this is really about the interaction side. How do people interact with this device? Uh, this type of model allows early assessment of how a potential user interacts with the various elements. So motions and the actions, are con um, and the actions of a concept which define the initial use scenario. Has anybody else produced a um, user experience prototype? Go ahead. Which is a mix of uh, many of these kind of prototypes, but uh, but also it's focused on that you can try to mimic the you know, get the user experience and see what happens in the hand. So. Thank you. And for your one, I guess it's working out whether the design is intuitive or not, and it could be that you could quite easily it's do some easy tests. To hold together. Quite, yeah. So you might want to see whether for the for the wind reader. Given the components, do they know exactly what to do with it? How do they interact with it? Do they hold it up? Do they put it the wrong way around? Uh, do they know how to operate it? And so on. Uh, here's an example of uh, myself doing a, a user experience uh, test. This is uh, modeling a, um, an aircraft uh, cockpit. So the idea here is instead of um, having a joystick down by your right, you may have a, a touch screen and interact with two screens in slightly different ways. And this, as you can see, this isn't a real cockpit. It's just a simulator to, just, to try and get some insights into how I'm interacting with it. And they basically just run a few different configurations on me looking down at the, uh, the device, perhaps me just touching the device and seeing where my finger is on a display screen in front, me using a joystick and seeing whether um, uh, the cursor is in front of me and so on. And they recorded this and they made some notes and they looked at response times. So they could make important decisions about how they're developing this product based on how I was interacting with this quite crude mock-up. We then have visual prototypes. So this is for the styling of a product. So we can see here a very nicely styled BMW 305 using clay. They're not obviously going to take this out on the road, but it's to, to gauge uh, experience and, and desires about the product. And this is a Volvo 340, which I don't know why you'd bother. Uh, you might as well just stick some cardboard boxes together. Um, but uh, of course, we've seen lots of different types of uh, mock-ups, and they're, they're very common in the car industry. Any other, know any other industry where these types of visual mock-ups are common? I was going to put some furniture ones in, but the difference with furniture is it's sort of, you might as well make the final thing. <laughs> you know, there's no real working components in it anyway, uh, unless it's got some strange mechanisms. Um, did someone here have their hand up? No. I was thinking maybe smartphones, they must do a lot of things. I think that, that's the real common one. Uh, smartphones, handheld personal electronics. Uh, because obviously there's a lot of software and electronics development to go into them. There's no need to go that far. Perhaps you can have the form design first. And it depends what type of company you are. Bang Olsen will do this extensively because they have a procedure of the function follows the form. They produce their form first and then fit the functions within it. Other companies don't have this so much. They have function prototypes first and then try to fit the form to the function. So Dyson is much more about form following function. Bang Olsen will be about function following form. And then the functional prototype. So this is the, the final stage prototype. This is essentially a full working model, almost trying to exactly replicate what the product would do. Uh, sometimes it can be scaled down, as it says here, to, uh, to save a little bit of cost and time. 
where essentially it's supposed to be a complete replica of the production model. Here's a, a nice case study. Uh, it's called the Advanced Passenger Train. This was a, a train uh, development. Oh, you can't really see it very well here. Um, but a train developed uh, in the UK. Um, and they produced a, a functional prototype of this. But because the project management was so poor, they actually released the functional prototype as the, um, as the final version. So they actually had passengers traveling on the functional prototype. Uh, needless to say, the whole thing was a complete disaster. But uh, the lesson to be learned from it is don't, don't take your, your functional prototype as your final uh, design. It's not a production version. You're supposed to learn from it. It's supposed to be to iron out creases. <clears throat> Here's a, a decomposition. I'll upload this onto the web so you can have a look at it. But there are basically these three pillars of uh, prototypes. The form and user human factors analytical market understanding and then physical operation and production. So the different prototypes will sit on these three dimensional axes. And have any of you seen the, uh, the comedy Curb Your Enthusiasm? Anyone interested in that? Well, this was a, a nice little clip from it that really summed up prototyping for me. the whole episode, the idea is the inventor wants to mount a camera on a, the antenna, the, the radio receiver, and then you have a little uh, screen in your uh, driving panel to see what's up ahead, and then you can raise the antenna up and it'll look around. And they basically have the prototype of this periscope. It's completely ridiculous, but emphasizes the point. Um, so that's the first part of the lecture over. Do we have any questions? Okay, uh, the course evaluation is now open. So, uh, you know, we've put quite a lot of effort into this course this year, so we'd really appreciate your feedback. So if you've got a moment in this break, uh, I'd really appreciate if you could do the evaluation. And if you could try do it in this break, because the lecture goes really downhill from here on. So uh, it's good to do it at this point. Uh, you've got 15 minutes break now. So if we come back at 22, uh, 20 to 10, thank you. <laughs>